So, just to review, we started this a little bit yesterday. Amphibians, the word comes from two Greek words, ampha and bios, right? We double life, it says. Amphibians evolved to be able to spend a significant amount of time on land, but they all still need to return to the water for what? Well, not so much. To reproduce. They need to return to the water for reproduction. Question, Daniel? Yes. Okay. If we, instead of double life, can we put living things on your test? No. Don't, you don't have to worry the same about that. Thing? No, it's talking about the two parts of the word and what they're doing. So, amphibians include frogs, toads, salamanders, and newts. We looked at some pictures of them. All right, so let's be talk about some of the um, adaptations that amphibians have and some of their characteristics. So amphibians, what kind of body temperature do amphibians have, Tanya? Warm-blooded? No, not warm-blooded. Cold. 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 They are cold-blooded. Their body temperature can fluctuate, can change with the outside environment, with the temperature of the air and the water around them. Okay. Um, and let's just rem let's remind ourselves, what is the benefit for an organism of being cold-blooded? So they, they, there's some downsides. They can't be active when it's very cold out. Okay. Um, what's one of the benefits? Olivia? Exactly. They don't need as much food. They don't need as much energy because they're not spending a lot of energy keeping a high body temperature. For, for example, mammals, it takes a lot of energy to keep our body temperature, whatever it is, 90 or 98, depending on the type of mammal. And so that means a lot of the energy that we consume goes into maintaining a high body temperature. Cold-blooded animals don't need as much energy because their just body temperature is changing depending on their condition. Don't Frogs, like, can't they like, absorb stuff through their skin? Is that why you shouldn't touch a frog? Well, not quite. We sort of. We're going to talk about that in a couple minutes, so we'll get that. All right. When frogs do reproduce, as many of you probably have learned about, they go through a process of complete metamorphosis, change in their body structure. So, how many people have like caught or seen tadpoles in a stream or? pond or somewhere. Probably a lot of you. Anyone ever capture them and try and bring them home, put them in a bucket or something? <laughs> it often does not work very well. Do your tadpoles hatch change into frogs? Okay, yeah. It's tough to keep them alive. No. Alright, so those stages in metamorphosis, you're maybe familiar with, they start off as eggs. Okay, that will start to develop if they're fertilized. Body male frog, sperm cells fertilize those eggs, they can start to grow. Those eggs eventually hatch, and when they hatch, the young are kind of fish like creatures called tadpoles. Tadpoles have gills, they have a tail, they have no limbs. So they look a lot like fish, but they're not fish. They live in the water. But as they mature, what are the changes that happen in the tadpole? What's one thing, Hannah? Well, their tail grows shorter. Their tail gets shorter and shorter, mate. Their legs start to develop. Gets larger. The gills go away, and what takes their place? The tail grows. No. Skin and lungs. Lungs. So their gills start to disappear and lungs start to form. Because what are they changing to do? Oh. And they're to, to breathe and to live where? On land. On land, out of the water. So those are the changes that happen as the tadpole matures. So we start with the eggs, then we have the tadpole that hatches, then those legs start to form, the tail gets shorter, gills disappear until we have a little froglet, it's called which eventually makes its way on the land and becomes an adult frog, which then can, re can um, start the cycle again by laying eggs and continuing the development.
Okay, just when we talked about fish, how many chambers were present in a fish's heart? Is there two? Two. An atrium where blood enters and then a ventricle which, pump, which pumps it out. Amphibians, however, have a little bit more, a little bit different heart. So if you look at this heart, how many chambers do you think this is? Three. Three. Oh, yeah. It's a three-chambered heart. There's two chambers on top, two atrium on top where the blood enters the heart. And then they lead to one ventricle. So the right atrium is here, left atrium, and then the ventricle. Did I make a mistake when I labeled these right and left? No. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh. Oh. Yeah. No, I did not. Oh, right. Oh. So why does it seem like I reversed them? How do we label organs when we're looking at them? Like sort of. You imagine that this heart it's like is inside of a frog that's laying on its belly facing you. For example, if I were an amphibian, I'm not, but if I were, and that was my heart, my right atrium is on my right side. But when you're looking at me, this is what? It's on our left. Yeah, it's your left. So this is my right hand, but when you look at me, it's on your left. So that's why we rewrite them like that. you got to imagine that like you're looking into an organism to label the parts. So it's a right atrium, left atrium, and ventricle. Well, backwards, sort of, yeah. Organisms. Left and right. Like my left kidney is on this side of me, but when you're looking at me, that's your left. Um, all right. Now this three-chambered heart is a little bit more efficient at getting oxygenated blood to the cells of the body. Because blood that's go coming from the lungs and blood that's coming from the rest of the body is kept separate for a while until it gets to the ventricle when there is some mixing. Amphibians get oxygen, obviously they need oxygen like all organisms. Um, and they're able to get that oxygen in a few different ways. Okay. Amphibians have very, very thin skin. And the underside of the skin is covered in blood vessels. When we do our frog dissection, dissection eventually, if you peel back the skin, what you're going to see is a whole bunch of blood vessels underneath the surface of the skin. And they're there to absorb oxygen from uh, the air from the water um, into the blood to be transported throughout the body. So the skin of amphibians is thin. It's not like scales on a fish or a reptile. It's a thin skin that allows, it's permeable to oxygen. And it's filled with blood vessels. And amphibians are able to use their skin to get oxygen throughout all of their lifetimes. Amphibians sometimes use gills as well. When are they primarily using gills? Yeah, in the tadpole stages. And those gills are adapted to getting oxygen from what? The from the water. But as the tadpole matures, those gills start to disappear. And what takes their place? Lungs. Lungs. Lungs are present in the adult stages of the frog. And they're adapted to getting oxygen from what? The air. From the air. They used to breathe on land. So they can get oxygen in various ways. Yeah, they can live in the water, but they can't absorb oxygen through their skin. All right, our last slide here, a little bit more about uh, amphibians. Most amphibians will hibernate 
<laughs> because it is so cold during the winter in certain climates, uh, cold-blooded animals can't be active at such extreme temperatures. Like right now, cold-blooded creatures would be inactive. The temperature is too low. So they hibernate for the winter. What is hibernation? Holly? Like when an animal or an organism like sort of falls into sleep, you could say, and just doesn't do anything. Yeah, and that is helpful because why? How is that helpful, Dana? Because since they're not moving around, they don't need to get food. Yeah, they need very, very little energy because all of the body processes slow down. The heart rate goes very, very slow. They absorb oxygen only through their skin. They're not moving at all. They're not active, and so they can survive on very little energy. So it's sort of a deep winter sleep. Often amphibians will bury themselves in the mud for hibernation. I've heard something like that. And then they still need energy because they're still alive, and anything alive needs energy. But where do they get that energy? Yeah? It's so No? Not from the mud. They have it stored up. They have it stored internally in something that is called a fat body. When animals eat more food than they need the energy for, extra energy, extra calories, gets stored as fat. Mammals store fat in a layer underneath the skin. Amphibians do not. Amphibians store fat in an organ inside of their body. It's called the fat bodies. When we do our frog dissection, you're going to see these. And I'll show you a picture here. They look like these orangish, yellow um, things, and they're all inside the abdomen of the frog. And all these yellow things you see here, and you see them over here, they're basically all fat. And that's energy that this frog had stored up. And if it were going to hibernate, it would be using that energy from those fat bodies to keep it alive. Just cut up so when you dissect your frog, if you open it up, you see there's a lot of fat bodies in there. What do you think it means about your frog's life before it came to you? Yeah? Well, it, maybe it was at the beginning, or it might have been what? They lived in a really cold place, and it was in hibernation longer. Well, if it was in hibernation for a long time, what would you expect those fat bodies would be like? Oh, smaller. Smaller, because the energy would be used up. Oh, so they live longer. Well, so if there's a lot, it means they had a lot of food available. Maybe um, it was late in the summer, so they'd all summer to gather up that energy. Okay. If you find the fat bodies are much smaller, maybe it was in a poor condition, so maybe it didn't have a lot of food, or maybe it had just come out of hibernation and used up lots of that energy. Yeah. Um, so it, it depends. It's, this is partially because of the picture. But the organs in a preserved frog, they're kind of all brownish, greenish color, gray. Yeah. Then? Would people get, like, not that they would want to, but would people be physically capable of hibernating? No. Because we're warm blooded. Our body temperature doesn't drop down by that, like that. So, all right. Finally, reproduction. Frogs have external fertilization, which we just talked about. The female releases eggs into the water, and the male fertilizes them in the water. And has anyone ever seen frog eggs? You may have seen them like a stream or something. Anyone? What are they like? They're really small. They're small, bunched together. Do you try and pick them up? They're what? They're like jelly. Like jelly. They're they're enclosed in a jelly-like substance that sort of keeps them in one area. Um, and amphibians, they produce like hundreds of eggs. Remember, in fish, it was thousands or tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands. Amphibians, they lay a smaller number of eggs, you know, 100 or so. Generally in the springtime, like most animals in um, temperate climates, they reproduce in the spring so that their young have all spring and summer to sort of grow, store up energy, lots of food, and so on. And they have this jelly coating. Okay, you can see here, each of these little black things is an embryo, a frog embryo, and they're surrounded by this clear jelly. I don't think it tastes great on toast, but it's a lot. Yeah. Is that what they're called? Yeah. 
No, I didn't really either. And so they stay together so they can be fertilized all in one place. And so they're in a mass and then hopefully um, they can grow and develop and hatch in the tadpole. Yeah. Not quite. They're similar, but a little, a little smaller. Fish eggs are smaller. Fish eggs are so Any of these would be edible. I don't know anybody that actually eats amphibian eggs. I've never heard of that. But, you know, if you're starving to death and you need a source of food. I just eat the frog. I don't think I eat its eggs. I eat frog. 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 I e